Thank you for coming to my presentation. My name is Josh Taylor. I'm studying cardiovascular medicine with a focus on rural and undeveloped treatment. It's uh, under the mentorship of Dr. Samuel Wilbert. So a little bit about me. I am a senior this year at Frisco High School. I'm a drum major and I'm a tuba and a tuba player for the band. Um, I hi I'm highly involved with my church, First Baptist Church Frisco. I'm an ISM II student. Last year I just studied cardiology. This year I'm adding the extra focus. And I'm interested in a medical career. And so my quotes for this year, my first quote is, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men. And so what that means to me is that whatever I choose to pursue, be it medicine, be it business, whatever it is, that I should be focusing that, those efforts on honoring God. And so if you're doing work for the Lord, it's going to be much more fulfilling, that, in my opinion. And so second quote related more to medicine is, medicine is the only profession that labors incessantly to destroy the reason for its own existence. And so what that means to me is that doctors are constantly trying to make it so people no longer get sick. And so, kind of weird because that's their whole job, right, is to treat sick, sick people. But if they, their real goal is to make it so there aren't any more sick people. And so that's really cool to me. And so my topic this year, it's twofold. It's cardiology and medical mission. So a little bit about cardiovascular medicine is that the reason I want to do cardiovascular medicine is because I'm interested in science and the work done in the medical field. Heart disease is currently the leading cause of death in America. About half the population presents major risk factors for heart disease, and about a quarter of the po population ends up dying from cardiovascular disease in America in developed countries. And so I also have family history of heart disease on my mom's side and my dad's side, and so it's kind of been running in the family. I've grown up around it. And I have previous ISM experience in cardiology, and it was really awesome last year to get to see all that. And so I want to do underdeveloped treatment because I feel like that's an awesome opportunity for like mission work and things like that. And so risk factors of heart disease can be treated easily with medication and physical activity. And the issue you see with that is that in these underdeveloped countries they don't know about like, heart disease, they don't know what causes heart disease, and so they aren't doing what it takes to prevent it when it's really simple to prevent. And then cardiovascular treatment is a good source for ministry, as I was saying earlier. Cardiologists can go down to these countries and they can provide medication, provide information, and then they can provide the gospel. And so I feel like those are some of the most important things you can provide. And then there are a lot of ethical concerns with, with medical missions in general. And so kind of looking at some of those and how to fix some of those. And so that's my topic. Then some of my research. I've spent most of my time so far this year researching medical missions. I've spent a lot of time last year researching cardiology, and I feel like I have a grasp as well as I can at this point in my educational career. But So I'm kind of trying to understand medical missions and what that looks like. And so Christian medical missions is the provision of free medical care to, 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 to other people to show God's love and to share the gospel. And it doesn't have to be in foreign countries. It can be in domestic countries like free dental clinics, free health clinics, things like that. Those can be medical missions, um, but it also is in developing countries. And so there's multiple aspects of medical missions. It's not always just going and treating people. You can go and you can build clinics, actually do the construction work to provide like a clinic like up there in the picture. You can also do temporary medical excursions. That's where like a medical group will take a two-week trip down to Honduras and they'll set up a clinic there with five or six doctors and they'll just treat as many people as they can over those couple weeks. There's physician training. I interviewed a guy who was involved with physician training and he would fly over to Southeast Asia and they have tons of doctors in Southeast Asia but the doctors don't really know how to correctly treat people. They don't really know what to look for. So they'll treat people based on like their like symptoms, not what's causing their symptoms and so their treatment isn't very effective. And so there's physician training is an aspect of medical missions. There's also full-time medical professionals in an area. So you are a doctor, you go to Samaritan's Purse or you go to an independent organization and you say, I want to be a medical missionary and they will actually send you and place you in one of these countries and you will live there and work there for five to six years and maybe come back to the States then go back over there. So full-time medical profession. There's also missions residency programs. So after you finish med school, you're still training as a doctor, you can go to one of these organizations, one of these hospitals in developing countries and finish your education there. So that's really cool. 
some missions organizations that are very well known. North Texas Missions, I've interviewed a lot of people there. They are centered here in the Dallas area and they send medical missionaries to Honduras. World Medical Mission and Samaritan's Purse are more national organizations who focus on sending like residency programs. They can have some more flexibility with the services they provide because they're so much larger. And then other independent groups through different churches across the nation and across the world also send medical missionaries. And so my interviews so far this year, my first interview was with Bob Johnson. He's the founder of North Texas Missions. And so he kind of gave me an introduction to like what missions is all about and what medical missions is from his perspective. And so he's a businessman, he's not a doctor, so he kind of got to show me some of that side of missions. And so on their trips, on North Texas missions trips, they do medicine, optometry, and dental medicine. So they'll send doctors, dentists, optometrists, and they'll provide people with like cholesterol medications, they'll provide pregnant women with like prenatal medications, they'll provide glasses to people, they'll actually make glasses there on site, they'll clean people's teeth, they'll pull teeth, they'll do all those things. And so they provide kind of a large amount of services. And so one thing I learned from Mr. Johnson is that there's kind of a few hoops you have to jump through to get into these countries and to do medical missions, but it's not as much as I was expecting. I was expecting physicians to have to go through like more training in these countries because if some foreign doctors were trying to come into America to try and practice medicine, you can just imagine all the things they would have to do. But going into these countries, they're less developed. They kind of need all the help they can get. So they pretty much just have to send over their American medical license and then they'll be verified and then they can practice in these countries. And so another thing that North Texas Missions does, they have an interesting focus on deaf education and special education training. And so they don't only send like physicians and dentists, they also send speech therapists, they send some like special education teachers from this area and they kind of teach the people in the community how to care for these people and how to kind of meet their needs because in these countries they don't have as much medicine, they don't have as much resources to provide for um, pregnant mothers so they kind of have more health issues from birth and so there's a lot of um, concerns with that and they're trying to work on that. And then my second interview is Dr. Bazell and he's a part-time missions doctor and so he kind of showed me the medical side of missions and so we talked a lot about like common cases and s the medical resources in these areas and so I found it really interesting when I was talking with Dr. Bazell. He said that multiple times during like a couple week trip down there, he would see people come in who were deaf, but really it was just they had so much like earwax in their ear that they couldn't hear because they didn't know like that was, you had to clean out your ears. They, that, they weren't aware of that. So it's kind of interesting to see like they really have no education about like basic hygiene, basic care in these areas. And so a lot of the medical cases would maybe go like two days in America before someone figured it out and these people could have been living it with living with it for years or months and so another interesting thing um, so if in America if you get a fever you take a Tylenol and then your fever has gone within five or six hours right but in these countries they don't have access to like common medication they don't have they don't know to use that and so people will develop a fever and they'll be living with that fever for two weeks or three weeks and the problems with that is you start denaturing some of the proteins in your brain and some of the nerve cells in your brain and so people will be partly blind, they'll be partly deaf because they've lost some of that tissue, some of that nerve tissue and so they aren't really communicating with their um, organs and so it's kind of another interesting thing that's going on in these countries. My third interview was with an optometrist, Dr. Coley Marsh and so he kind of sh talked more about optometry and the culture of missions it was really interesting to kind of hear from his perspective because I've pretty much interacted with doctors up to this point and I sent medical doctors up to this point and he was an optometrist and so he told me some of the reason why he chose to do optometry rather than medicine. He was actually planning on going to medical school but he switched into optometry school so he could start a family and so he talked about optometry. He said it was a way that he could almost get into the field faster. He was really anxious to start practicing and things like that. He also talked about the culture of these areas that he visits. They're much more thankful, they're much more patient. They appreciate their ability to help. He said in Frisco, 
there's oftentimes you aren't really able to do that much for the people because they come in and you fit them with a pair of glasses and they leave. But with these people, you're able to fit them with a pair of glasses. You're able to like show them like lots of different things they can do now that they can see, and so it's really awesome. And he said his most the most rewarding experience he's had is he's able to share the gospel through these experiences, and so that was really cool to hear. And then my fourth interview was with a registered nurse, Miss Erin Baker, and she talked to me about her personal missions experiences. She said it was extremely eye-opening. She says practicing in America, everybody's almost impatient. Um, people will be like, I want to be treated in five minutes, and they come into a full emergency room and be like really almost mad because they aren't being treated immediately. And so when you go to these areas, people will be waiting in lines for 10 hours, 12 hours just to get a 15 minute checkup. And so she says it's crazy how much more thankful they are about the services you're providing. Uh, you don't have to go through as many of the like logistical hoops in these areas. You get to more just practice medicine. And so she, she really encouraged me to go on a medical mission trip. And so that's something I'm looking into for this upcoming summer. And then the last interview that I've had most recently is Dr. Sam Alexander, and he's a retired OBGYN, and he's a missions educator, and also an, he's educated in ethics. He has his master's in medical ethics. And so I got to talk to him a lot about kind of some of the ethical concerns of medical missions and like what all goes into that. And so he showed me some alternate side. Previously, everybody who I had interviewed had gone on these like two-week trips to treat people and he showed me that there's a lot more to medical missions than that and what he told me is that like he, so he goes to he's the one who goes to Southeast Asia and like trains doctors how to be better doctors and so he says arguably that could be a better use of resources than spending like thousands and thousands of dollars going to these areas where there are already doctors and so I think we'll get into more of those ethical concerns here in just a second and so a little bit I did a little bit more research on cardiology this year. Um, I found this article in, I think, Google Scholar about breakthroughs in cardiology. And so I found this interesting story about the first catheter to the heart. And so this, like, 23-year-old kid was just messing around in the lab during his residency. And he wanted to find a better way to get medication to the heart. And so he took a, like, a dialysis catheter. and he entered it into his own heart and then he walked down the stairs to the radiology department so his friend could take an x-ray so he could see if it actually went into his heart and then it did and then he walked back up to the catheter lab took the catheter out and so he was the first person to do a catheter to the heart and he was almost fired for it but I thought that was a really interesting story and then also medications are I found out more about those being major breakthroughs. For example, the poly pill, it's a combination of cholesterol medication, blood pressure medication, and statins. And it could be given to large populations because it's not in such high dose that it increases risk for liver failure or anything like that. So the use of this in a medical missions type standpoint, you could almost diagnose large populations. Like I think the statistics the article was referencing was men over the age of 65 in these developing countries because there's not as many men over the age of 65 there. They're at an extreme risk for heart disease and so it would be a safe bet to give all of them these, this poly pill because it would actually help all of them. So that was an interesting article as well. And then medical ethics, a little bit about that. Medical ethics is asking the question, is it a good thing to do and what's the best thing to do? And so a little bit about that, like what resources do different areas need? For example, Honduras right now needs people to go down there for two or three week trips because there just aren't physicians. There's not a public health system in place that can act, like effectively treat these people. And so they'll send doctors down there. But Southeast Asia has thousands and thousands of physicians, almost as many physicians per capita as the United States. So they don't really need more doctors to go over there and treat people. They, more, they need more people to go over there and teach their doctors how to be better. Um, some countries need more clinics. Some people need specialties, things like that. And then there's also medical ethics concern with foreign residency programs um, because they'll be sending over these like 
people who are just out of med school to do treatments, which they wouldn't be allowed to do in America. And so that raises the question, is less quality care still better than no medical care at all? And so that's kind of, like, that's a battle. Like, you, you don't, nobody wants bad care, but if you aren't getting any care, you know, bad care might help a little bit. And so that's kind of an ethical concern with medical missions. So that kind of leads into my original work. And what I'm planning on doing is an assessment of the medical needs in developing countries. I'm planning on looking at the doctors per capita, the types of facilities that they have, the accessibility to medical advice and medical, um, I guess, training, physician training and education, and major medical concerns, like the Ebola outbreak would be an example of a major, major medical concern. And then just basic access to food and water and sanitary sanitary resources and so what I hope to be able to do in looking at all those kind of features of a country is to be able to see like what they need the most so if a medical team was interested in traveling say to Honduras what would be the best type of medical team to send there who would most who would meet the needs most of Honduras and so that's what I'm hoping to do with my original work and so it brings me back to my quote I'm, I believe that medical missions is a way that we can kind of stop the need for more medicine in developing countries, and I feel like it's an awesome way to um, work for the Lord rather than men. So, thank you.